Uh, it is my great pleasure, and that, that's not like hyperbole, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Bob Accamini, who is from the Paul Grave, uh, well, he's one of the editors of the Paul Grave Marx Angles Marxism series, uh, and that is a plural Marxisms, and I am, uh, we are so happy that we were approached by Hia Marcello to begin this series. And today is episode, is our first meeting. Um, and of course my, my, uh, my, my device goes on uh, uh, screen save, but Babak I, I, I know is a PhD candidate at uh, the LSE in London, and his research examine. And I'm reading exactly what I uh, want you to know. He is researching the council democratic movements in Germany and Italy right after the First World War, and he uh, is the editor. Of, he is a, one of the coordinating assistant editors of the Marx Engels Marxism series, and. He's also co-editing a, a new book that's coming up entitled The Rutledge Handbook of Marx's Capital, A Global History of Translation, Dissemination, and Reception. Good going, Baba. And uh, Karl Marx's Life, Ideas, Influences, a, a criti Critical Examination of on the Bicentenary. I'm not going to, I mean, Baba can explain that when those books come out. Hopefully, we'll have uh, book events those two times. But at this point, I want to turn the, the Zoom floor, so to speak, over to Baba to explain better what the series is all about and then get uh, today's panel uh, up and running. So, welcome, Baba. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, part of this uh, exciting program. Um, I have uh, participated in a few in the past and watched some um, um, afterwards, and it's uh, really an, a, you know, a great uh, platform to discuss these ideas. And we are very excited to start uh, this uh, ongoing process with you to um, feature some of the, uh, the books that we have been publishing in our book series. Um, just wanted to give uh, the audience a very kind of brief uh, uh, overview of what this series is about. Um, as you probably know, uh, uh, a there is a revival of interest um, in Marx's work um, on a global scale, really. And uh, whenever the, the critique of capitalism reemerges, there is an intellectual and political demand for new critical engagement with Marxism. And now this peer review, Marx, Engels, and Marxism, and I'll put the link in the chat in a few seconds. Um, edited by Marcello Musto and Tara Carver with me as uh, one of the assistant editors uh, with uh, Francesco Antonini, Paolo Rahula, and Koa Saito as other assistant editors of the series. Published monograph, edited volumes, critical editions, reprints of old texts, as well as translation of books already published in other languages. Um, our volumes come uh, in a wide range of political perspective, subject matters, academic disciplines, and geographic areas, and it's uh, meant to appeal to uh, diverse and international audience. Our main areas of focus in the series include uh, books that are written on the works of Marx and Engels, Marxist authors and traditions of the 19th and 20th centuries, labor and social movements, uh, Marxist analysis of contemporary issues and reception of Marxism in the world. Now, so far, we have published 40 volumes uh, in the series, and I put the link in the chat uh, for anyone who is interested in, uh, in checking out the, um, the series page. And uh, we are also very excited to uh, for this upcoming year, 2021, we are anticipating to publish about 35 new volumes. Very exciting from uh, you know, from places from Japan, China, uh, Latin America, Europe, United States. Um, and um, I'll send the uh, the flyer with the uh, list of forthcoming volumes. I don't know if I can do it in the chat. Uh, if I can't, I'll send the, the flyer to, to Michael to, to distribute in the, uh, 
in the mailing list. Uh, but we are very excited to have our first uh, panel today. And uh, there, we have two more uh, scheduled, one in, on 20th of March and the other one on 24th of April. Each one features three different books of, uh, of the series. And uh, I hope that uh, all of you can join us also for, for those uh, panels. So I, I, I uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. I give the, uh, the Zoom floor, as you said, back to, to Michael. I think you're muted. Yes, it, it is uh, one of those aspects. So thank you, Babak. Uh, I, I, I hope I pronounce people's names correctly. Uh, I won't have problems with our second speaker, but Jean Numa, is that how I say your name? So right. absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, today we we will ha uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have our three speakers with us today. Um, uh, and, and they are going to, the title of today is Heterodox Socialism, which to me is a, an incredibly exciting title. And it's such an appropriate way for us to be beginning this series, because when we look at the this title of Marx, Engels, Marxisms, and, and then if you looked at any of the flyers or promotions, you see the book jackets coming out. We are really dealing with uh, uh, the, the fact that all of us growing up during the time we did and now uh, nearly a quarter way through the 21st century, we have seen mm -hmm. that the, the Marxism of a hundred some years ago is really a, a world of many Marxisms at this point. And we will begin with looking at three different, very significant uh, uh, figures in, in the history of this. And um, I will turn the floor over because you don't want to listen to me. Um, um, we will have each speaker go for about 20 minutes. And afterwards, there will be a question, answer, and discussion period. When you have a question or comment, please, if you know how to use chat, write the word stack in chat so that we can a call on people in sequence. And with that, I'm turning the floor, the Zoom floor over to Jean Nima. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you to speak about heterodox Marxism. And so first I will present uh, uh, the figure of Jules Gued, and uh, he's a famous socialist uh, in France and uh, more generally the birth of uh, Marxism and socialism in France at the end of the 19th century. So Jules Gued has not remained in history uh, more than a rather orthodox than heterodox figure of Marxism. One need only remember that the famous phrase of Marx reported by Engels, what I know is that I'm not a Marxist, would have been pronounced about uh, French Marxists like Ged to be conveyed of this. Yet, um, in studying its place in the history of socialism of Marxism, things are not so simple. And this is one of the main ideas that runs through my book on Ged. Indeed, Jules Ged contributed to founding Marxism in France and to giving it an original form, different from other currents or other socialists. So I will come back on that. The orthodoxy, if there's easy to be one in France of French socialism is rather Republican. And Ged, however, took unfair influences, especially on the Marxist side of German social democracy. Let's us, um, first take up some biographical elements about Jules Ged. So Jules Ged, born in 1845, at the time of Paris Commune, he was an advanced Republican, not yet a socialist. He saw positively the birth of the first Republic, of the third, sorry, Republic, welcomed the action of Communard, so participant of Commune Paris in 1871, with a socialist rhetoric, but still far removed from Marx at this moment. 
Luther versed in theoretical debates. It's very important to understand the other. He was a man of action. He was already known for his talents as an organizer, speaker, and journalist. Persecuted for his opinions, he took refuge in Switzerland after Paris Commune, where he took refuge from the anarchist. He even publishes texts that are extremely hostile towards the man who will later to be his master, Karl Marx. The identity of the character is forged during these difficult years. Exiled in several countries, in Italy, in Switzerland, hunted by the authorities, he is also very early affected by several painful diseases. A fact of importance in understanding his popularity among anarchists and French socialists, and its echo among the militants. Unlike another famous figure of French socialism, Jean Jaurès, uh, Jean Jaurès was after get the big leader of French socialists. Uh, Jean Jaurès was students of École Normale Supérieure, the most prestigious school in France. Ged was not in a prestigious school. He was not in the French elite. He is a kind of professional revolutionary. That's the reason, one of the reasons, because he was very popular uh, in, the milit in the French militants, between the French, among the French militants, sorry. In 1880, along with a few others, especially Paul Lafargue, some in love, Karl Marx, of course, and Benoît Malon, Ged is in charge to give a program to the first workers' party in France in 1879, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 79, sorry. So he leaves France for London, where Karl Marx has taken refuge and meets him. The result was the Considérant du Parti Ouvrier, so considerant, considerant about uh, Workers' Party, it is the first Marxist political program in Europe. From then on, Ged had an undeniable historical aura. He always knew how to remind his opponents that he had concretely introduced in France the first socialist program with Marx's ag agreement. Also, he is neither the most brilliant nor the most original of the socialists, he has an important historical legitimacy. So Gates Marxism is very political and made of slogans. In his socialist catechism, so Catechisme Socialist in French, published in 1873, and then regularly written by, the, by its current, he has lots of editions. Um, so it's a very evocative title socialist capitalism, all Ged and the so-called Gedism, Gedism in French, are already there. It's a summary Marxism, rudimentary but effective and imaginative sometimes. He handles the taste of anecdotes with a lot of talents. So for many people, it's a kind of a desolate Marxism, a poor Marxism, and for the best connoisseur of Marx, it's not a very interesting Marxism, but at the political level, it's very important for the birth of Marxism in France. And the birth of Marxism in France was important for all the Social Democrats party at this moment in Europe. To quote a friend of Ged, very famous in the history of the French workers' movement, Marcel Cachin. Marcel Cachin was very close to Ged. And then after the First World War and the birth of the French Communist Party, he was the director of the French journal L'Humanité and one of the most famous dirigents of the French Communist Party uh, he did in um, 1958. So he has a long life. About Ged, he said, about the first Ged at the end of the 19th century. According to Marcel Cachin, Ged understood the primordial necessity, it's my translation, so sorry, of the constitution of well-educated and disciplined cadres for the organization of a strong worker party armored with a just program. He knew how to gather around him a phalanx of disinterested and admirably dedicated pioneer workers. Ged was one of the first to know how to organize a one guard of socialism in Europe. And Ged was not only a militant. The first time in 1893, he is a representative, he's elected at National Assembly, so à la Chambre, as we say in French at this moment. 
And as an elected representative, he was a deputy from the north, from the industrial north, Roubaix Vatrolos. So it's uh, the suburb of the big city of Lille in France. Get thought of himself above all as a party deputy, disinterested in local problems the first time, and his opponents exploited his weakness and attacked it in particular his strong friendship, friendship sorry, with German Marxists. Because of course during this period we are after the German France war, and it was very important for Get to show his solidarity with German workers. But it was very dangerous to show this, this kind of solidarity at this moment in France. And so what is interesting for the global history of Marxism is that, forget, rather than a mass party, it is finally, in certain aspects, quite close to the conception that Lenin will develop at the beginning of the uh, 20th century in what is to be, in what is to be done. In this sense, it is rather unter, un, unorthodox compared to French socialism, because the French socialism is rather from with Republican logics, not really centralize our current party. Centralization, forget, a, tem, a team of followers, even an avant-garde, he draws in part from a Jacobin heritage while drawing closer to the logic of the Russian socialist in a certain sense. Just a few words about this problem of Republican, Republicanism in France, because it's always a problem, a problem today. It's a very important point to understand uh, French politics, but even at this period, it's very important, and it's very important for the French workers' movement. So I, I would just take uh, just one example, which is very important for history of France is the uh, affair Dreyfus, so the Dreyfus affair at the end of the 19th century. Just as a reminder, at the end of the 19th century, France was, France, sorry, was divided over the conviction of a captain, Alfred Dreyfus, accused of high treason, he was a member of the army. In fact, he was accused because he was Jewish. And Ged, supported the first time uh, the case of Dreyfus, but finally refused to descend the captain accused of high treason, not because he was a Jew. Some Gedi, some member of his parents, were more or less anti-Semitic, but not Ged himself, but primarily because Ged, wa uh, sorry, Dreyfus, was a military man for Ged, a socialist, does not defend the bourgeois state, one of the main components of which is the army, which is shooting at this moment the workers. Ged first presents himself as an authentic socialist in the face of others who are betting on a progressive democratization of the republic. What's the point for Ged and his currents of defending a bourgeois republic that shoots the workers at this moment? Don't forget that at the same time, at the time of Dreyfus' affair, a socialist, a French socialist, entered in a government of broad union, Alexandre Milran, and Ged refused to support this coalition between bourgeois Republican and French socialist. The contrary, Jaurès support this coalition. So, in fact, the currents of Ged do, do not present themselves as being, for example, on the left. For them, the left is a parliamentary artificial cleavage, very good for analyzing the bank of the bourgeois camp. They want to be the incarnation, Geddes want to be incarnation of authentic socialism of the so-called, in French we say at this moment, collectivism, so collectivism in English, or the workers' movement, the authenticity of the workers' movement, but not the incarnation of the left. What is very interesting for a topic today about orthodoxy and orthodox is that in other configuration, when you study not only Ged, but the Gedist, what they make in uh, some cities, in different regions, Get end up entering into a republican logic by voting at the parliament progressive laws, for example, and playing in alliance with the radical. Be careful, the radical, it's in French, radical, 
uh, radical don't uh, it's uh, the center left at this moment moderate left so the republican if you want the left republican and so sometimes get an alliance for the local elections with these radicals just an example the socialist Gustave Dolory conquers the city of Lille, one of the biggest cities in France, the most biggest industrial city at the end of the 19th century, in 1896. And Charles Bonnier, at this moment, a Christian to get, says that this is the victory of the dictatorship of the proletariat in one city. What is very interesting, it's very radical in words, but Charbonnier didn't say that he include his, his, in his majority in Lille some moderate Republican in order to be to have a majority. So there is a kind of opportunism, or if you prefer, pragmatism in the political practice of this current, of this Gaudis current. Get retain a Marxist rhetoric announcing the arrival at the time of a new world a form of utopia that other currents lake. But the flag side is a reputation for opportunism of a current that willingly combine three revolutionary declarations with a political practice that forgets the great principle. So another second heterodox, if you want, element is this time in relation to the second international Marxism in the German style. GED is integrated into national parliamentary and republican logics, despite, he said sometimes, in spite of everything, especially the influence of Marxism. Another important question is whether GED is the left wing of the socialist movement at this moment. If we study very quickly, don't worry, militarism, colonialism, we can try to answer this question. Taking, for example, the question of colonialism, which is a very important question for France at the end of the 19th century, it was the second most biggest empire in the world after the Great Britain. Gade in Romilly, Romilly is a small industrial town in 1896, at the Congress of the Workers' Party, vote for a motion criticizing the colonial order in the first time. Then at the beginning of the 20th century, the Moroccan, at the time of the Moroccan question and the establishment of protectorate, get as another discourse. He support a project of a socialist Morocco established by socialist settlers who would show the indigenous people the way forward. And at the same time, Jaurès, for example, was much more critical of colonialism. Get as not really a critic of colonialism and he thought that the best way is to imitate the French socialist in France. Other examples, so it was an example about colonialism. The other very important point is the trade unions. In France, there is a specific tradition at the CGT, so Confédération Générale de Travail, the biggest uh, trade union in France, it still exists today. In 1906, there is a vote at CGT Congress on what posterity as a remembering of Chartre d'Amiens, Charter of Amiens, constitutes a disable for Gédist. The Gédist and Ged are very close to the German line, so the trade unions have a link to the party and the party has decided the most important things. But in France, there is a big tradition for the trade unions of independence between the trade unions and political parties. And Ged, on this point, was not very strong, and he is in the in the minority, and his partisan too in the trade unions. And last point, so colonialism, trade unions about anti-militarism, Ged and the Gedists are not very involved in this uh, struggle because they think that the main problem is capitalism and not the other things. So. Alfred refers, we don't care because it's the army. Anti-militarism, we don't care too because it's not the main problem. So if we speak about left, center, and right 
in the framework in the uh, framework of French socialism, of course, Ged has introduced Marxist things in French political life, but he's not really the left wing on all the subjects for the French, for the history of French socialism. Just a few words to conclude about the Socialist Party and the future of Gedism after Ged's death. What influence did it have finally on the Socialist Party before the First World War? Of course, he was a very close during a long time to the German Social Democrat Party. He has a lot of relation with Kautsky, for example, at the beginning. But after 1905 and the unification of Socialist Party, Kautsky, Bebel, and the other German leaders support Jaurès too, because they have understand that it's very important to have Ged, of course, but it's very important to have the other one as Jaurès, because the Republican tradition is still very strong in France, despite the fate of Ged at the end of the 19th century. Of course, another very important point is that, as you probably know, um, Joès is dead just before the First World War, but get participate to the French government. Let's try to understand these things very quickly. The socialists felt that France was under attack and its border must, and its border, sorry, must be defended. This time, Gade approved. The class struggle, he said, my translation, will take back its rights later. From the time being, territory integrity of the Republic must be defended as in 1971. A betrayal of the socialist and the Marxist ideal and its pacifist base forget at this moment. There is more, this is more a form of continuity that does not seem so difficult to assume because Ged was very anti-militarist, was not very anti-militarist before the First World War. You know, probably the famous word of Leon Trotsky, who sent him an assistance letter in October 1916, which he concluded as follows, over you add, I send a fraternal greeting to the French proletariat, which is awakening to great destiny. Without you and against you, Long live socialist France. So get support the world. He was ministry in 1914. And then after he's more critical against the war, but is, what is very important to understand is that in 1920, just a century ago, he chose not to join the communist international. Her fault, many of his Marxist friends trained by him made his choice to join the French Communist Party. Marcel Cachin is a good example. So his old companions, uh, some of old companions are communists now after 1920, other um, still um, in socialist party and Ged is dead in 1922. So what's the result? As a result, Ged, uh, Ged sorry, gave a more revolutionary call that to the French socialist, uh, perhaps a more Marxist too, that, than in other countries. But there are lots of ambiguities. As well as maintaining the idea that radical rhetoric could also go hand in hand with very pragmatic management and also perhaps a certain class incurring, which has its hour of glory of the 19th century, because Gates speak always about class struggle of the importance of the class struggle for the, for the French socialist. It's a very big difference with the other currents. And one of the reasons, because perhaps not only get, but it's current and this constitution of this current, especially in the north of France, one of the reasons because the French left have during a long time the vocabulary of class struggles. So how we say in French, the repair de classe, that's because Ged was strong despite its ambiguities at the end of the 19th century. And to conclude about the question of identity, which is very important for the French socialist movement. Uh, perhaps a more important legacy, it's this 
kind of identity. This is a marker of Ged and his legacy to the French political history. These marks can be found, for example, not only in this companion, but in the history of the French left during the long time. For example, in the French Communist Party, which was, which was for a long time the first party in France between 1945 and 1980. It's a kind of practice of alliance of management at the same time as a very marked revolutionary rhetoric. You know, we are very pragmatic, we have red flag, we have a lot of struggle, but at the same time, we have agreements with center left and Republican movements. The French Communist Party has practiced during a long time this kind of things, and I think it's come from Gideism. So if there is a specificity of the French, of some kind of heterodoxy in history of socialism in Europe, I think that is very important about this point. And certain currents of the far left also at this type of practice in France, especially in Tversky's groups. And on the side of the Socialist Party, which is always very strong today, which until recently was the most powerful party of the French left, it should be emphasized that this party has long had a strong left wing, borrowing a necessary Marxist vocabulary. For example, the Marxist vocabulary was very strong in the Socialist Party in 1970s. And you sh we should explain that. And how can we understand that? I think we have to come back to the end of the 19th century. And here again at this point, again with his currents, has contributed to Marx the French left and his history up to the present day, and has marked the history of European Marxism too, because of course France was at this moment very important. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. So I just uh, have more 20 minutes, only 20 minutes. So perhaps if you have questions, we can discuss this after. And sorry again for all, I'm with my children. So if I disappear during five minutes, don't worry, I will come back, it's just a small problem. Yes, thank you very much. And sorry for my French accent, but it's typical, so it's not. Thank you, Jean. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm turning the floor now over to Michael Bree, who is going to speak on his volume on Rosa Luxemburg, but I'm not going to uh, take any time away from Michael's presentation. So, uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Yeah, good day and good evening. At least for the Europeans, it's good evening. To you, it's uh, noon, I think. Yeah. Uh, firstly, of course, Babak, I should uh, say congratulations for the, uh, to the editors of the series Marx, Engels and Marxism. It's really a, a wonderful job you are doing. And I hope we all can meet again the last time we met in Berlin, I think, before we met in Pisa. So thank you very much. Um, uh, in three weeks, we are celebrating the 150th birthday of Rosa Luxemburg. Yeah? It's in March the 5th. So you should already buy a good bottle of wine yeah, to um, uh, honor her. And as you all know, she was killed at the age of 47, 47. Yeah. Uh, she um, lived only until uh, her 47th year. Um, but the problem for me when I'm uh, now speaking is beyond my G very German accent, of course, um, is that why to write a book about Rosa Luxemburg at all? There are a lot of books about Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, there are two uh, different wonderful biographies like the, the classic by Peter Nettle or by Annelies Laschitzer uh, about um, Rosa Luxemburg. There are a lot of other books. There's a huge amount of literature, and we are in the book. We are giving a review of a part, at least, of this literature. So why to write again about Rosa Luxemburg? There are, is one objective and one subjective reason I want to give. The objective reason is, firstly, only in the last years, part of the Polish writings of Rosa Luxemburg were translated into German. And now we are also organizing the translation into English, but this will take time. And um, uh, so one should understand that often from the outside, 
the view on Rosa Luxemburg is she was a German social democrat, a German socialist politician. But that's not true at all. She was a combination of Polish-Russian traditions and later, of course, on German socialist and, and uh, Western European uh, traditions. And one of the reasons of her strengths is this combination of different currents of socialism. Uh, so we know now much better um, this background, but of course we still have to publish in the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation the Polish works in the complete works edition. Also in the last uh, decade, two um, uh, new volumes of the works of Rosa Luxemburg were published in German language, so there is a new literature. And secondly, this is a subjective reason why to write a new book. It's a very personal one. Jörn Schüttrumpf and I, we are working for, on, for more than two decades for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And he is the head of the research center on Rosa Luxemburg. And um, so for us, it was a very personal task. I think we should wanted to understand what have we have learned um, working for a foundation which is using the name of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, what I, when I'm looking back to, to this book uh, I'm presenting and uh, the German edition was now published, you can find it at the uh, website of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and soon, I think in April, the English edition by Pelgriff in the series already mentioned will be published. So um, what we try to do in this book is to reconstruct why Rosa Luxemburg is so, has such a lasting influence. Because if we are comparing her, let's say, with Marx, Marx created a scientific revolution. Rosa Luxemburg did not. Lenin founded a new type of state. Mao Zedong organized the state. But Gramsci developed a huge theory of socialist strategy. This is all not the case with Rosa Luxemburg. So what is the importance of Rosa Luxemburg? And this is behind our, our book. Um, what I want to, um, to explain is what is special is about Rosa Luxemburg that the, the let's say, the, the product of herself is not a state, is not a totally new theory and so on, but the way of life she was living this is special of Rosa Luxemburg. That's why she is so attractive and so fascinating. Because she, more than all the others, I think, at least the known figures, of course, was able to lift the contradictions of socialism of her time. Yeah? And uh, of personal life, of political intervention, of journalism, of mm -hmm. theory, of party organization, and so on. And, um, um, and in a very existential way. And also it is important that um, if, um, if we want to understand Rosa Luxemburg, on the one hand, of course, we should read her articles and books and so on. But on the same time, and at least I think as important are the letters of Rosa Luxemburg, because they are uh, putting together the contradictions um, uh, of her life and, and work. I want to start with um, one uh, the, uh, my beloved quotations of um, Rosa Luxemburg. She wrote it in November 1918. That means two months before she was killed and after being, she wrote it after being released from prison. And um, she uh, wrote it and called for the immediate abolition of death penalty. And in this article, she was writing uh, the following. In the four years of imperial genocide, blood flowed in rivers and streams. Now, every drop of the precious juice must be guarded with all in a all in a crystal or a crystal bowls. And then that comes the most restless revolutionary energy and the broadest humanity. This alone is the true idea of socialism. Yeah, I think this is the in, inner core of her essence. Um, and um, if you're looking then 
back and we try to of course we are going from from the polish uh, from the zurich time to berlin then uh, the discussions on the participation in to, in government in france um, with milleran then of course the intervention during the first russian revolution uh, the works on accumulation during the war her uh, works and so on until the founding of the communist party of germany and the november revolution and um, the struggles in Berlin in January 1919. Okay, but all the time we try to understand how she was dealing with the contradictions of the of socialism as a social and as a personal affair. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, to 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 make to to show these contradictions, she had two heroes, political heroes. On the one hand, Karl Marx as a the person who was analyzing, giving the scientific analysis of capitalism and so on. And the other person was Ferdinand Lassalle, the founder, the first, uh, the founder of the first workers party in Germany. And for her, the one was saying history is made because of objective conditions. And the other was saying, yes, but we should make history. That for her, Lassalle was the maker of history, the, by, by free action, free will, and so on. So she was very fascinated by, um, by, by both, but especially even, I think, personally, a little bit more by, by Lassalle. I want also to prove the importance of contradictions uh, in Rosa Luxemburg's work and life with regard to the famous work you all know, the Russian Revolution. She wrote it in prison in late summer, autumn um, 1918. And again, what we can learn, she circumvented the logic. You should be for us, or if you are not for us, you are for the enemy. Yeah, she tried to deal in a very different way, and in the book we are we want to want to stress that maybe we should understand the, this famous paper on the Russian Revolution like a symphony on the Russian Revolution. That means a symphony of four movements. There is a first and the last movement which is appraising the Bolshevists, and there you um, will find. This, uh, this central motive, like a beating drum, this paper starts with the words, the Russian Revolution is the mightiest event of the world war. And then she is appraising the Bolshevists that they are going beyond the questions of tactics and are focusing on the most important problem of socialism. And what is the most important problem of socialism to her? This is the capacity for action of the proletariat, the strength to act, the will to power. And uh, if you are looking then on the end of this uh, paper, you will find again, she says, in this sense, by strengthening the ability of the proletariat to act, Bolshevism will last forever. But you can read also this last sentence that only in this sense, only by empowering the people, empowering the working classes, Bolshevism will last. And then in between the first movement and the last movement, there are two, two parts. One part is, sorry, now Mike, I, I have to open the door for the cat. Yeah, one moment, please. Yeah. And can I have the same problem too? The children so see, and the cats. It's also close to Rosa Luxemburg as she was in love for her cats. Yeah, she was I all the time caring for the cats. Yeah, uh, uh, for the most important person person in her flat was not herself, was not uh, Matilda, but was a cat. Um, okay, uh, so in our case, it's almost the same. Um, yeah, my wife, of course. Okay. Um, but um, what I want to say in the second movement, she's criticizing the Bolsheviks for uh, her, for the agrarian policy and for the, uh, the attempt, uh, for the right of self-determination to the nations in the Russian Empire. And she's saying this is going away from socialism. 
you are not going directly to socialism. That's a first. And then she knows very well why the Bolsheviks are doing it. Yeah? Because to, to moderate especially the contradictions between the government, the new Bolshevist government and the people, the peasants and so on, and to win them for the, uh, for the revolution. But she said, this won't work in the long run. Yeah, it won't work. You are, it's a self-defeating um, attempt. And then she's saying, but uh, I'm, uh, the third movement is, she's criticizing, as you all know very well, uh, the Bolshevists for not implementing um, uh, democracy uh, and not giving political rights and free speech and so on. You know all this. I should not quote it um, here. Um, the problem is, on the one hand, she is telling the Bolsheviks, you should use the iron hand of the dictatorship. Yeah? This is also in this work, yeah? the iron hand of the proletarian dictatorship. You must suppress all interests, not going directly in the socialist direction. And then the, she is saying, um, but uh, on the, in the same moment, you should uh, give unlimited democracy. Yeah? It's a deep contradiction. Yeah? And one should ask oneself how she could live with these contradictions. Of course, I think she had no solution for this, but she thought that by creating, even by force, common ownership, a common frame, also, that, uh, from common a Republican or whatever, a Soviet framework, then people in these situations of common ownership and so on will go with social in instincts into the direction of this type of socialism. This was her idea, I think, a very strong communist um, uh, idea. And she, she said the social instincts in place of the egotistical ones Mass initiative in place of inertia, idealism, which concurs all suffering, all this will solve these problems. Yeah? So she had a very clear understanding um, how to deal with these contradictions. Um, so I'm coming to the last point. How, uh, when, when we finish the book, I, uh, we ask ourselves how all this is possible to deal with, how to, how to understand this, these deep contradictions in the work of Rosa Luxemburg. What is the mystery behind? And uh, I found in the work of a, a Leipzig, uh, of a philosopher from Leipzig who died recently, Volker Kaiser, he said Rosa Luxemburg was a truth speaker, a person speaking the truth. And he, is, he was referring to Michel Foucault, in the last lectures of uh, Michel Foucault at the Collège de France, he discussed this, uh, this um, idea of paresia from, from the Greek language, yeah? the person speaking the truth, the truth, paresia. And um, the most quoted words of La Salle in all her works of Rosa Luxemburg was all the time, um, as La Salle said, the most revolutionary act is and forever remains to say loudly what is. That was her uh, preferred quotation. And one may say, um, uh, with regard to Rosa Luxemburg, um, is what, sh what she was speaking about was what, sh not what is, but what should be. She, try she tried to express the spirit of an emancipatory socialist movement. And this has... I very briefly, five dim dimensions. Firstly, to be a person speaking the truth means you should fight for the space where you can speak the truth. The first. The second is, if you really a truth speaker, and of course Foucault was referring to, to Socrates, you should be ready to sacrifice yourself for the truth you are saying. Uh, and of course, Rosa Luxemburg did this. Uh, she was ready to go uh, up to the, to the final um, um, uh, step. Thirdly, and if you are reading her letters and also uh, the articles and books, she's all the time demanding that 
the people she is addressing in personal and in political relations should change according to the truth. They should become also true people, true parties and so on. This is hurt. And then, of course, fourthly, um, uh, to, to speak the truth in this sense means by your own life and work to create what Ernst Bloch was um, um, uh, term, uh, terming uh, foreshine. That means anticipation of a, a true, better, solidary uh, society. And fifthly, of course, and that's why the book is in the series of Marx, Engels and Marxisms. Uh, Luxembourg speaking of truth stemmed from Marxism. That means she really lived the contradictions of, in a very special way, very personal way, very concrete way uh, of Marxism of her time. And um, so what we, we try to, uh, when I should, let's say, when I should summarize the idea behind the book, um, I found uh, in the work or life of Rosa Luxemburg a kind of categorical imperative, try to live the contradictions of socialist movements in a solidary and emancipatory way. That I think we can learn by Rosa Luxemburg. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, very good. Um, we now turn to Kieran. Kieran, you are back. Okay. Um, uh, he is going to speak on uh, Raya Donievskaya, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Kieran. Thank you, Michael. Um, and good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so you've had a French accent, a German accent, and now you will have a Scottish accent, which I often find people can find the hardest to understand. So I will do my best. Um, um, so it's yeah, it's great to be able to speak today about um, Diana Skaya and the book that Kevin Anderson, Heather Brown and I edited on what we are calling her intersectional Marxism. Um, and, you know, Diana Skaya, I think it's fair to say, is a somewhat understudied figure in the history of Marxism. Someone who has very much been on uh, the margins of mainstream debate, despite you know, her many contributions to both Marxism and to 20th century radicalism in, in general. Um, so it's a sobering fact. Uh, I think that our, our collection is the first edited collection on Dino Sky and really one of the only pieces of secondary literature um, uh, dedicated to her writings at all. Um, so the first thing that, you know, we wanted to do when we put the book together was to help rectify this situation to help bring Dania Skaya, this really important figure in the Marxist tradition who was literally ahead of her time and uh, was so in ways that I'll come on to discuss, to bring her back into the present, into our, our present moment with all its, its tensions and contradictions, but also with the, the, the great promise that I think it holds. And when when conceiving of, of, of the book, of the collection, we, we wanted to um, explicate Dunyovskaya's ideas and engagements as, as well as to put them into dialogue with other ideas and engagements, both historical and contemporary. And to this end, we, we have chapters from a number of leading authorities on, on Dunyovskaya, uh, Peter Hudis, Kevin Anderson, Rodolfo Mondolfo, David Black. Uh, we also have chapters from Adrian Rich, the, the noted um, radical feminist poet from Paul Mason, um, award-winning British um, journalist, author, and filmmaker, as well as from a whole other series of figures from the intellectual and activist left in the US and beyond, Lily Monzo, Heather Brown, Frederick Monferon, Carol Ludenhoff, uh, Dindi Katonga, and Alessandro Spano. And we think and hope that taken together, they, they bring what is uh, a really international and, and diverse set of perspectives to this volume that captures in this way 
something of the the real force of of Dunevskaya's contribution to Marxism um, and radicalism more generally. Uh, so I thought that rather than talk about each chapter in turn, uh, the best way to convey the significance of the book and of Dunevskaya more broadly would be to give an overview of her, her life and contribution to Marxism. And so here goes. Dunevskaya was born in 1910 in, in what is now the Ukraine, and she lived there until 12 years of age before moving to Chicago and to the Jewish ghetto in, in 1922. Um, and Chicago was her home for, aside from brief stints elsewhere to Pittsburgh and West Virginia, etc., until she moved to Detroit in 1954, where she remained for the remainder of her, of her life. And as a young woman, uh, she became involved uh, with the youth section of the American Communist Party in, in the late 1920s, before she was expelled due to her criticism of the treatment um, meted out to Trotsky at that time on, on the part of the Soviet state. She then became immersed in the Trotskyist movement during the 1930s, uh, even acting as uh, Trotsky's Russian secretary, for a period while uh, he was living in Mexico. But she eventually broke with, with uh, Trotsky in August of 1939 after uh, Stalin signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact with Hitler and also following Trotsky's repeated refusal to relent from his insistence that the Soviet Union remain the worker state, albeit a degenerate one um, at this period. Um, and so this kind of this break with Trotsky was a really defining moment in her life. It, it led to the, um, an intense period of, of questioning of the Soviet Union, a period of considering the deeper sense in which she argued the USSR was not a workers' state, that it was in fact a capitalist, or rather a state capitalist organization. Um, in, in, a, in arguing this, of course, Dunevskaya was going against the whole host of other figures in the Trotskyist movement at the time, uh, people like Max Schachmann, uh, James Burnham, Joseph Carter, all of whom categorised the USSR um, as a form of bureaucratic or um, state socialism or bureaucratic collectivism. And Dunevskaya was openly hostile to these arguments and accusing not only um, Shackman, Burnham and Carter, but also Trotsky of failing, as she, she saw it, to pit the abstract notion of workers' state against the reality on the ground. Her argument, contrary uh, to the others, was based on a detailed analysis of the first three five-year plans, um, alongside readings of Marx's early writings and Das Kapital itself. And through this, she was, she was able to put forward um, the critique of what she called the fetish of statified property. So the, the, the idea that the mere fact of state ownership of the means of production somehow nullified the effects of the whole manner of production as experienced by the workers themselves in a system in which um, they were routinely separated from the control of their own labour. Moreover, she, um, she noted that the capitalist laws functioned she argued, in the USSR, just as they did in, uh, in the explicitly capitalist nations. She argued that repeated, the repeated appropriation of, of surplus value, which, after all, is the, the basic defining feature of, of capitalism for Marx, could be found at the centre of both systems, capitalist and communist, or so-called communist. Um, and a number of chapters in our book deal with the various facets of her analysis here, particularly the chapters by Peter Hudis and Alessandro Spano, um, and to a lesser degree, uh, my own chapter, as well as the, uh, the first chapter written by, by um, Peter Hudis and Kevin Anderson. And so by the time that Dunya Skaya was developing this, this critique of the USSR, she had joined forces with uh, CLR James and Grace Lee Boggs, as the leading members of uh, what was known as the Johnson Forest tendency, or alternatively the state capitalist tendency. 
Jamie Ovskaya uh, and James, as you may know, had, had uh, both developed towards this p position independently, um, but their, you know, their shared criticism of the USSR deepened during uh, the period of working together through what was an extensive period of engagement with Hegel and Hegelian dialectics in, in the 1940s. Uh, the 1940s, of course, being a period of you know, great, great flourishing for Hegelian Marxism. Uh, it was also a period in which Marx's economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 began to become more widely available, although this process uh, really takes off, I would say, in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so during this period, uh, Dunyovskaya um, and the Johnson Forest tendency in general, were one of the first uh, in the English language to make to make use of these manuscripts, and particularly Marx's um, um, appropriation of Hegel's notion of the negation of the negation, um, and what they were able to do by taking over Marx's distinction between the two stages of negation, so the abstract negation of private property in the form of what Marx called crude communism as a first stage and the, the second positive negation uh, in terms of the transcendence of, of, the, of the first negation was that they were able to mount a, a strong critique of Stalinism directly out of the writings of Marx himself. Um, and it's important to, to point out that it was Daniel Skyler who, uh, out of the tendency, who led this critique of, of of Stalinism and, and did so with um, impressive scholarship. At, at the same at the same time um, as this engagement with Hegel and the 1844 manuscripts, Dunyevskaya was also working on what was then known as the, the Negro question or the Black question. Again, alongside alongside James and her critique here centered on the the incapacity, as she saw, of, saw it, of the working class movement in general to grasp the specificity of the black dimension, the failure that is to grasp the, the particularity of racial oppression and the agency also that characterized black struggle. So she was clear, you know, as, as far back even as the 1940s, that, that rather than being homogenized, as, as she saw it in the kind of abstract unity of the working class, um, the black struggle against racialization needed to be recognized as central, uh, on, uh, sorry, as legitimate in itself, but also, as she argued, central to American radicalism per se. Um, in fact, she later would, would argue that the, the black dimension, as she called it, provided the touchstone to U.S. history, uh, that the black masses constituted uh, the vanguard of, of U.S. radicalism in, 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 in all its stages. Um, and this, in, this engagement with, with black struggle, this recognition of the uniquely radical role played by black Americans with whom she was involved personally, you know, as well as theoretically, strongly ties up today um, with the critique of, of, of class reductionism that, that so, uh, is abounding and flourishing in, in, in um, the aftermath of the recent Black Lives Matter protests and the death of of George George Floyd and, and many others, uh, and this again is a is a theme that many of our chapters pick up on, um, none more so than the chapters by Lilia Monzo, Dindi Katanga, and and Heather Brown. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, importantly, for for Diana Skaya, it's it's her her thinking here is around the fact that it's not only the notion that race and gender and sexuality, as I'll, I'll come on to in a moment, that it's not only that they, these concerns ought not to be subsumed under the demands of, of, of class, but that anti-racist struggle, as with anti-sexist and anti-heterosexist struggle, provide what Dunyevskaya described using a phrase taken from Marx as the new passions and a new foot new forces that develop in the bosom of society and that impel the revolutionary struggle towards what she saw as the development of new stages in consciousness. Um, 
and uh, importantly for uh, for Dean of Sky, uh, her engagement or for our understanding of, of Dean of Sky, her engagement with with black struggle and black radicalism in the US was part of her wider engagement with what she termed the, the voices from below, something that is exemplified in her participation with the workers' movement in general. Um, so uh, during the course of the 40s, she moved away from groups such as the SWP and the Workers' Party uh, to form a series of independent groups focused around uh, worker intellectual collaborations, mostly in the form of, uh, of newspapers and study groups, first of all with, with James Grace Lee Boggs and others as part of the, the correspondence committees. And then after her split with, with James as part of news and letters committees, which was the group she set up and was to remain in for, for the rest of her life. And it's in, it's in this period, the period that she, in which she struck out on her own, so to speak, although with other figures such as Charles Denby, etc., that she intensifies her studies of Marx that led to her first book, Marxism, Marxism and Freedom, which was published in 1957, and where, in, in contrast to certain theoreticist tendencies within Marxism that were coming dominant at the time, she defines Marxism as a philosophy, or defines it explicitly as a philosophy of human activity um, and agency, and extrapolates upon Marx's uh, practice of incorporating the development of working class consciousness into his own writings, as she points out, can be seen even in the work such as Das Kapital. Um, and again, a number of chapters in our, in our volume, including Rodolfo Mandolfo's, Frederick Monferrand's, and uh, a few others, deal with Marxism and freedom at, at length. So it's, it's from this reading of Marx, but also uh, her reading, her deepened reading of Hegel and, and his notion of absolutes during this period, as well as reading Lenin on Hegel, that Dinovskaya engages during the 1950s, um, that she comes to develop her own account of the relationship between organization and spontaneity that is exemplified in, in what she terms the dual movement between theory and practice. So a movement from practice that is in itself a form of theory and the movement from theory that is in itself a form of practice. And the position she develops here was um, in explicit opposition to that being developed by James and Lee in, in this period, who were moving to a more directly uh, spontaneous position or spon spontaneous position that sought to, um, in the end, dispense with the need for Marxist theory in general. For, for Diana Skaya, this, this uh, merely gave up, she said, the one-sidedness of theory for the one-sidedness of practice, a position that she went on to critique in, in some detail in her second book, Philosophy and Revolution, uh, published in 1973, in relation to certain Maoist and anarchist approaches. Um, and Kevin Anderson, in his sole author chapter in our, in our volume, has a, a, has a discussion of this, as does... Um, also Hudis and, and Spano. Um, and by this stage, um, what Dina De, De, Skaya was arguing was that we need to unite the decentralized committee form with the movement from theory in a way that avoided the vanguard party formation, but that retained a role for the dialectic between theory and practice. And it's, it's here in the latter part of her life, based partly on study of Marx's ethnological notebooks and, and partly on an extended reading of Hegel that she stretches the Marxian dialectic even further, um, applying it to the African revolutions and the, the women's liberation movement uh, also. And in philosophy and, and revolution, uh, she, she explicitly engages with the, the African revolutions as she describes them, um, and she describes them as imperative struggles against colonialism and racialized disfigurement, but also uh, as part of the wider connected dialectics of liberation of the era. So for, she 
she formulates here, I think, a notion of what we can call the connected dialectic that she takes from Marx, um, and particularly his later work, I guess, and applies to her own day, um, drawing attention to the ways in which not only did the, the black struggle in the United States influence the African revolutionaries, but the African revolutions themselves also helped to spur on um, the revolts in, in black America and even in Eastern Europe. Um, then in the, the very the last period of her life, um, there is a concerted move of focus um, to the women's revolution, as she called it, um, and on how the women's revolution itself, women's, the women's liberation movement, was influenced by examples of black and anti-colonial struggles um, as part of the wider kind of connected dialectic. And what you see in, in, her, in her later books, such as uh, Rosa Luxemburg, Women's Liberation, and Marx's philosophy of revolution is a turning more and more to the feminist struggle, which she noted was one of the most anti-elitist forces and new passions that had come on the historic stage and that was raising new, new questions, um, um, altogether new questions, she said. Particularly, the fact, particularly important in terms of the feminist struggle was the fact that the struggle of women against patriarchy sought to challenge, as she argued, male chauvinism not only under capitalism, but also within the revolutionary movement itself. Um, and so there's another example of which um, she utilizes Hegel, the Hegelian notion of the dialectic between the universal. Um, and the particular here, um, and showed the ways in which it, it, this dialectic and the women's struggle gave further impetus to radical struggles the world over. Um, she has a historical appreciation of, of this also, of course, including um, in her discussion of the Russian Revolution and the Black and African struggles, in which, as she points out, it was women who were very much at the forefront of the initiation of these struggles, um, women who, as she put it, were, were force and reason um, uh, rather than, um, you know, an incidental part of these struggles. Um, and again, a number of chapters in our collection deal with, with these issues, such as Lily Amondo, um, Heather Browns, and Dindy Katongas. Uh, while Carl Luden, Ludenhoff also has a great chapter on, on, on Dean of Sky as a Marxist humanist, engagement with, with Luxembourg's account of uh, the nature of capitalist crises. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, we, yeah, we cover, we cover, we hope, and I think we cover the whole length and breadth of Dunuskaya's Do no Do no engagement in, in the book along these, along these lines. Um, I haven't mentioned the chapters by David Black, who uh, has a historical account of, of Dunuskaya's Do revolutionary travels as he describes it in Britain and Europe in the late 1950s and uh, and her engagement with groups in this period. Um, Paul Mason also has done Dino Sky so much he has he has two chapters in fact one uh, looking at the connections between Dino Sky and Trotsky and Frida Kahlo a second one and developing uh, along the lines of a uh, kind of moral philosophy that he draws out um, from humanism. Um, but yeah, so I think I've reached my, my time limit um, and it would be good to get questions. So I will hand the floor back to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I try to clap loud enough for everybody, okay? So um, we uh, will now take questions and comments. I, I did put in chat, I hope all of you know how to use chat, um, uh, that you do stack. And, ah, I, Babak, you have enough to get us started. So uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you right now, Babak, to ask your questions of each person, and we'll go from there. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating talks. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I have a few questions for uh, each speaker. Um, a question for Jean Noma, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the rationales for Git to break from the national unity in 1916. 
And also, what was his take on syndicalism? Was it wholly negative uh, or did he have Okay, thank you. On? So you ca can I answer or no? Because I have a small program, children, and I come back, I will leave them. So about the first question, uh, he lived the national unity in 1916 because the war has, was very long during two years. And the first part of socialists said he, at the beginning of the first world, okay, uh, we agree, we support the France because German attack us. But after one year, after two years, there is more session and more session. Some people left the national unity. That's the reason between, because after two years, Ged and part of Gedist leave the national unity. And they support one year after the October Revolution, at the beginning, just at the beginning. So uh, Gedist were not the most chauvinist currents during the first world run in the French socialist. The second question, he, was, he has not a negative vision of syndicalism and tradunism in France. He thought simply that the German vision of syndicalism was a good vision. The party should decide for the trade unions or more or less the trade unions are linked to the party. In France, there is a, sp a big specificity coming from Proudhonism, from Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Uh, the workers has an autonomy and is the main expression of this autonomy is the trade unions. The party, it was a bourgeois, it was a republican. We are the workers and as workers, we have all trade unions. Get thought that the autonomy of the Workers' Party is the party. But a large part of workers, of militants, not all the workers, thought that the most important was the trade unions. It's a prodonist idea, co concurrent from Marxism. Do you understand that? It's very important. Okay, thank you for your question. It's two very important questions to understand. Just, just very quickly, um, did, did you have a comment on our, our elaboration on uh, USPD in Germany and the formation? Yes, absolutely. For example, in the north um, of France, where Ged was very strong, he tried to create a small SPD in France, you know, not a Republican Party linked to the other Democrats in France, but a small SPD, an authentic, specific workers' party, as in Germany. And it, what is very important to understand is that it's very, north of German, uh, France is very close to Belgium. And Belgium, it's a kind of social democracy. And there are very important and interesting links between Belgium and French. Not only because the Belgian people speak French, but it's important too, but because there are some historical links. It's very industrial and is more or less as Germany. Different in the south or in Paris, for example. Um, I don't know if okay, I so can I have five minutes and I come back. Sorry. <laughs> Thank Rob, you for your question. Questions for Michael and for Kieran as yes. well. Okay. Thank you. I come back. Yeah. Uh, my question for uh, uh, Michael was uh, it was a bit of a speculative question. Um, if you if you imagine uh, Rosa Luxemburg had lived longer, do you think uh, what do you think the kind of influence in the development of the Communist Party would have been uh, in, in Germany? Also, it's a very speculative question. Um, firstly, I think if we are looking back to the biography of Rosa Luxemburg, she, she had uh, sometimes uh, strong positions as the editor of newspapers, but never for a long time. So I, I'm strongly convinced she was not a strong organizational leader. Uh, uh, for me, she really was more a kind of modern prophet, uh, prophet for the future and speaking about this and, and to the masses and um, so on, but not as a, um, as a leader of an organization. She wanted to stay for a long time in the Social Democratic Party, then in the Independent Social Democratic Party because she wanted to stay with the masses. This wasn't possible any longer because uh, there was a strong attempt to organize a communist party and then sh she joined, but only because of this. Um, I, what would happen, nobody knows, but I, I don't think she would <laughs> should go with Stalin in the end. Of course not. Uh, um, the tragedy is more that uh, I think, of course, first the murder of Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht really created such a strong 
division between the communist current and the social democratic current, um, um, current in Germany. And often we are saying that, uh, that the communists, uh, criticizing the communist party, that they were accusing the social democrats to be a kind of social fascists. Yeah? But you, of course, will also find social democratic politicians saying the same towards the communists in Germany. So, but um, what uh, I think maybe more the way of, of Paul Levy, who went back to the Social Democratic Party to create an independent poll inside the broader mass democratic movement, but nobody knows. Um, um, I, I don't want to take too much uh, time, but uh, my last question for Kieran. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, why Zelenskaya uh, uh, turned to Hegelian studies in the 40s? It was either intellectual reasons or biographical. Yeah, so uh, both, uh, I think, uh, Babak. So obviously, uh, the 40s is a period in which um, uh, Hegel is, Hegel, uh, Hegelian studies are, are flourishing, Hegelian Marxism, the period in which, the, as I said in the talk, the 1844 manuscripts are. are uh, in, in, in circulation and, and her and uh, James were part of the first to kind of translate these works but the kind of reason she was engaged with, with Hegelianism in, in, at this moment um, it was I guess uh, initially in, in terms of this, this attempt following on from her reading of, of Lenin and Lenin's uh, Hegel notebooks to try and follow Lenin's thinking and to, to complete this thinking in a way that would answer the question between um, uh, organization and spontaneity in a way that would transcend the vanguard vanguard party. It was also a period, uh, the period in which she was engaging with and, and kind of um, with James and against members of the Trotskyist movement on the issue of race. And, and, and by going into Hegel's notion of absolutes, which are generally seen, uh, you know, as these closed entities that she saw, she her reinterpretation of of the absolutes gave her the theoretical material with which to kind of to form these new beginnings, to reopen what had seemed kind of closed um, uh, closed ontologies, and to kind of break out anew. So it very much gave gave a kind of impetus that would, would that fitted in, I think, with her her practical experience and the intellectual experience that she was engaged with in in the U.S. at, at, at the time. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, John, John Numa is uh, out for a moment, but could you ask your question of Michael? Can you unmute, John? Or I, I will read it aloud. Uh, John has asked, I am struck by the influence of... Okay, uh, see, sorry. I, I didn't realize you were speaking of me. Ah. Uh, Yes, so I, John, so I, you could ask of Michael the, the question yes, on the yes. Okay. Uh, 60 years ago this year, I walked into a bookstore in Hamburg, uh, the left-wing bookstore, and asked for a volume of Rosa Luxemburg's writings. And the proprietor, whose name was Axel Judas, uh, showed me a book and said, now you have to notice here that the first 135 pages are made up of a tax on Rosa Luxemburg. It had been published in the GDR, of course, and we explained their antipathy to Rosa Luxemburg and her ideas, which goes back to a famous article by Stalin. Now, in my work on the early Communist International, I find that there is actually a tendency in the Communist International that is descended from Rosa Luxemburg, and particularly the continuity is marked by Clara Zetkin, who is the most prominent figure in this tendency. And this tendency fought against the, uh, the, the apostles of radical action of all, at all costs and in favor of the united front and action by a united working class. And so as what with one thing and another, this current ended up as being identified more with Bukharin and with the right wing of the Communist International. I'm wondering what this evolution in German communism had to do with Rosa Luxemburg. Was it an authentic representation of her urge for uh, unity and co cohesive action by the working class? Or was it just unrelated and an accidental uh, evolution? Thanks. Yeah, I don't think it was accidental. If you see, uh, as you know, Paul Levy, who was uh, for some 
months or so, the lover of Rosa Luxemburg and then later the successor of her, the leader of the Communist Party of Germany yeah, and going together with a larger part of the independent Social Democratic Party. When started the break between, the, uh, between him and his uh, orientation, which was very close to Rosa Luxemburg, and, and Lenin, Lenin, not Stalin, with Lenin, uh, it started um, when uh, there was an attempt to, to um, organize a coup d'etat in, in Germany. Yeah? As you know, this in 1921. Uh, there was an uprising of communist-oriented um, workers in, uh, in the center of, of Germany. And Paul Liebe was totally against because he said Rosa Luxemburg teached us that there should be a broad mass movement. And only if there is a broad mass movement, the, uh, very different workers together, yeah, a, a huge part of the population, then there's any chance for anything. Yeah? The same attempt for her also during the uprising in January 1919 already. She was supporting the uprising when it was clear it was supported by the larger part of the workers in Berlin. And she stopped to support it when it was clear the, the, the workers are withdrawing from the uprising. Yeah? So um, uh, I think all the time, as she was not for action at all costs. She was for actions where it's broad, as the broad masses are empowering themselves yeah? and only under these conditions, of course. Um, and so I think it's a clear, it's a clear link. And if you, you are asking about the, the, the legacy, the problem is that the legacy was lost in the Social Democratic Party and it was destroyed in the Communist Party, of course, with the uh, Thälmann, as already earlier, but especially with Thälmann that coming in by the direction of Stalin and so on. All this was uh, clearly destroyed. And then we have a kind of um, idiocratic uh, relationship. On the one hand, there was the Rosa Luxemburg as a personal hero, but all the ideas of Rosa Luxemburg were criticized. Yeah? It was called Luxemburgism, or already Lenin started with this, and of course Stalin made it the ideology, a kind of semi-Trotskism, yeah? semi-Trotskism, yeah? very close, not totally Trotsky, but very close, so it's close to the enemy, and this was the relation to Rosa Luxemburg up in the GDR and the Soviet Union up to the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. misusing her as a person and denying the importance of the ideas of Rosa Luxemburg, more or less. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, is there anyone who is prepared to ask a question? Ah, Pete. Pete is on, Pete Dolak is on stack. Go ahead, Pete. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, so uh, I guess like a lot of folks, a uh, question related to Rosa Luxemburg, which uh, partly overlaps with people have already asked today, uh, uh, specifically in the question of, of the uh, KPT, uh, 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 how the KPD related to the Nazis in the run-up to the Nazi uh, takeover in the, in the 1930s. Uh, I always consider... Uh, uh, that uh, Trotsky's had the best contemporaneous uh, writings and, and thoughts on, on fascism. But I've always been of the opinion that had Rosa been uh, act, uh, alive at that time, she too would have been probably on par with Trotsky in her way of uh, being able to dissect it. So again, pure speculation. We, we can't go back and replay history, but uh, had Rosa Luxemburg, uh, been alive in the early 1930s, uh, could the orientation of the KPD been of, uh, less disastrous, shall we say, in the attitudes toward the Nazis and, and the whole rise of the Nazi party? I would uh, briefly say she would have been expelled much more earlier from the Communist Party of Germany. That's my opinion. Because you see, between the power of the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Social Democratic Party, uh, there was, you know it from, 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 from the history. 
the space in between, there was almost no space in Trotsky and all the others tied, of course. Yeah? But she, the, for her, the, I think in a Stalinist Communist Party, there wouldn't have been any place at all. Yeah? She would have left it. Mm. Also you see already the criticism uh, against Lenin in 1918. Yeah? She would never have uh, gone this way with, uh, with, uh, with Stalin. Never. Yeah. Do you think oh, she would have? Do you think she would have been squeezed out of the party then? Yes, uh, some yes I'm wife. totally sure. I'm totally sure. And if she would have, I think she was not a strong party leader. That's my opinion. I maybe you see the problem. Jogiches was killed. Yeah? Liebknecht was killed. A lot of others were killed. So the the German left was missing strong leaders. Yeah. Uh, and, and then uh, the Stalinists took over the, the, the Communist Party. Yeah? And the ability of Rosa Luxemburg to organize her, uh, her own party, I'm, I'm very doubtful about her ability to do it. This is a very special job. This was not her job, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, on stack, we have John, who can now speak to Jean Numan. Uh, there and then Katie has a, something that she has posted in stack. So John, John Nema is here again. So you can ask your earlier question. John? Repeating? Oh, I'm not sure I need to repeat the question. Jean Nema, uh, what I was saying was that your discussion of Gid's influence after his death through various generations in the um, French communist movement, it can be interestingly compared with the uh, intellectual uh, legacy of Rosa Luxemburg and how that played out in the communist international and the international communist movement later on. Stalin. So that was my question. I, I don't know if he's here. Um, Katie, so I know you posted your question, Katie. Could you uh, ask it? Um, hi, yeah, thank you very much um, to all the speakers and authors. Um, my question's for Kieran, um, and I just want to clarify to say I'm not an academic, so it's probably like quite basic, um, but just was really interested because it's um, uh, Raya Dunyevskeva, is that how you say? Um, Anyway, I haven't come across much of her writing uh, but before, so I'm really interested in uh, reading the essays in the book. Um, and I just wondered, given um, the connections that she had with CLR James, if you know if she had much contact with um, Selma James and the kind of like unorthodox feminist Marxism uh, that was characterised by the wages for housework kind of stuff in the 70s and I'm thinking about this also in light of what you were saying about her interest in like women's liberation struggle and how there's like been a resurgence particularly in Latin America in feminist movements that really kind of relate to this history like the idea of a women's strike and like thinking through how we can strike against the exploitation of reproductive labor and using this as a kind of creative strategy for feminist revolution and yeah like for me there are these connections there and I just wondered if you could speak about any of those. Hi Katie thank you um, great question um, so I, I noticed that, that Kevin Anderson is here so he he knows Daniel Sky far better than me and he may know um, um, specifically what the relationship between uh, Dana Skaya and Selma James may have been, although I would imagine that there, there wasn't an extensive relationship, but Kevin could come in on that perhaps. Uh, what I, I could say about um, uh, Dana Skaya's feminism is that first and foremost, the, the connection you make with the, the movements in Latin America and elsewhere across the world are, are something that are, that are central to two of the chapters in our book, the chapters by Lilia Monzo and Dindi Katonga. Uh, and they very much deal with the, the kind of issues that you, you you raise there in relation to the women's strike and other and other factors. Um, I guess the 
the, the kind of real signal importance, I think, of, of doing Skye's engagement with, with, with feminism, which although she, she wrote more about towards the end of her life, was there from the very beginning. You know, she was, she was working with miners' wives in, in West Virginia in, in the 50s and I think maybe even earlier in the 40s as uh, an explicit part of her engagement. But um, this, this kind of uh, concept of, of the women's revolution was something that, that followed from, from her own practice, her own understanding of following what she understood from Marx to be listening to the voices from below or to the new passions and new forces in society. And very much, obviously, the feminist, um, the women's liberation, which, which uh, you kicked into force, particularly in the 60s and 70s, uh, was something that she could see straight away was this kind of breath, breath of fresh air uh, into, into, into revolutionary struggle. And it was a revolution for her. It wasn't, although there are, of course, bourgeois elements to it, uh, for her, it, it was this opening, this, this, um, um, this opening to a deeper level of consciousness, to a deeper level in terms of the, the, the relations that structure not only capitalist society, but the leftist groups within that. So it was striking a heart uh, in relation to the left. And we you know in, in recent years, it's become pretty clear that the left has a, has a serious, serious issue with misogyny as well as, you know, other areas. So I think it's a, it's a very timely kind of um, engagement. And this is why I kind of argue that she's, she's, for me, a thinker who is out of her time. You know, the fact she spoke of humanism, perhaps, during, uh, as Adrian Rich argues in the chapter in our collection, w w was not something that endeared her to radical feminists during the, during the time because of the associations, wrongly, I think, that, that humanism has. But, but now, when there's a kind of pushback in relation, relation to that, I think it's quite clear that her engagement um, with um, the different forces and passions of revolution is something that we, we, we see that that development of consciousness, these struggles over over the successive decades and until now, is um, is at the stage of you know coming to fruition. Although with with them um, notable uh, tensions and, and, and um, uh, tendencies that push in quite the opposite direction, as we've seen we've seen in recent years. But yeah, thank you, Katie, for your question. Thank you, Karen. Ah, uh, Jean Noir, you need to leave. Bye bye. Thank you. Um, Rosie, you have a question for Karen. Uh, are you able to speak it? Rosie? Rosie? Uh, I think I read the question if, if Rosie can't. Uh, yeah, can yeah, uh, she, yes. Okay, Kieran, it's there. You can. I, the first part I can't tell, but she's asking African American struggle for agency and its rejection by American society was proof of U.S. racial capitalism. I think that the Haitian Revolution was also ignored as the true liberation of both human rights and the concept of universal emancipation from race and class oppression were forged. If they had used that revolution, it would have given more weight to the struggle for agency and perhaps the missing piece to arrive at universal emancipation in the 19th century. And that's what she asked of you, Kieran. Yeah, and um, thanks, Rosie, if you're, if you're here. The, I, think, I think you're right, absolutely, that, that and others here, um, as someone, although I lived in California for two years, I'm, I'm no longer there, as, as someone, others will know far better than me. I think clearly the, the kind of, um, the downplaying of African American agency and the importance in, in the American struggle is is proof um, of of the history of racialized capitalism um, as well as well as generally um, I guess this kind of class reductionist focus that has predominated in, in so much of the history of the left and that is also rearing 
rearing its head today. In relation to the Haitian Revolution, uh, certainly I think that the kind of humanism that Dunyevskaya engages with um, was broached seriously and, and, and most seriously in, in, in relation to the Haitian Revolution, which, as Rosie, I think, says, was right in, in terms of being focused on uh, a universal emancipation, a universal emancipation that we, you know, we didn't see in relation to the, the, the French Revolution quite in, in, in the way that um, uh, the, the, those fighting for the revolution in Haiti were, were, were very clear in kind of trying to transcend. Um, it's, if I tie this to uh, Dunyevskaya, who, uh, of course, um, worked with James for those, for those 10 or more years, um, she, was, she was obviously uh, in praise of, of James's work in relation to... Um, the black struggle in the U.S. and 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 this kind of new uh, relationship, as she saw it, between the universal and in the particular. But she was somewhat um, critical of um, James's focus on Toussaint Louverture rather than Louverture rather than um, a focus that she thought ought to have been on the elements lower and deeper uh, below him. So there was some kind of of kind of uh, dissensus between them. On, on that matter, but yeah, I think very much the kind of humanism that you see enunciated in in the Haitian Revolution is one that we're still looking at in, in terms of um, today, in terms of the completion of, of of the task of emancipation. So, thank you, Rosie. So, um, uh, John, uh, thank you. Can you ask your question uh, or, or make your statement that I see in chat? This is the one on CLR James, I take it. Okay, here goes. <laughs> uh, regarding Rena Danievsky's understanding of the Black liberation struggle, I think it is worth noting that her collaboration on this, her collaborator on this question, CLR James, was shaped in part by his discussions with Trotsky in Mexico around 1938. And Trotsky in turn was relaying the essentially pan-Africanist position of the Communist International back in 1922, which in turn had been brought into the Comintern's Fourth Congress by two delegates who traveled from Harlem, representing the African Black Brotherhood. And so there was a continuity going right back to the Lenin's time on this issue. That's all. Thank you, John. Uh, I see that I do not see another person on stack, but I will ask of Michael and Kieran. Jean Numont is gone, and I can't tell if Babak is here now, but Michael and then Kieran, can you uh, each speak to? Oh, Kevin, you have a. Go ahead. I will stop and ask mine after Kevin. Yeah, I just went on to stack. Oh, I did it first. It didn't get there because I sent it to an individual by mistake. Yeah, I have a question on Rosa Luxemburg and Stalin, and then a comment on Dunyevsk and race and gender. I'll try to be really brief, though. As far as uh, Luxemburg and Stalin. I think the bigger question, the biggest question is we can't assume Stalin coming to power with Rosa Luxemburg alive. I mean, I think we really have to look that way for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we just don't know what, it would, what would have happened in Germany had Rosa Luxemburg lived, had Yogish lived. There were certainly a lot of other important revolutionary uh, upsurges and even uprisings in Germany in the years after 19, the defeat in 1919. Uh, had she and Yogish been around, maybe it could have turned out differently. Uh, so we have to we have to consider that, I think. So that the rise of Stalin has to be tied to what we could call the decapitation. What has been I didn't, I didn't invent that term, the decapitation of the German Communist Party right at its birth. Uh, secondly, no, and, and Donievskaya, who I worked with, let me just mention a couple of things that maybe aren't known. You know that. Aren't, weren't always written down, but 
one thing about gender is, see, for her generation, don't forget, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, gender and women's liberation were not high on the agenda of radical groups. Uh, and I think this is true of Rosa Luxemburg too. Uh, there was a resistance by women who had theoretical and leadership abilities to be put into the women's section. See, Raya, and I think it's true of Rosa Luxemburg too, wanted to, so to speak, play in the field with the boys. She wanted to write on political economy. She wanted to write on dialectics and so on. And there was a feeling, and this, I think it took a long time. It wasn't until the 60s that that really changed that worry about, about being relegated to the position of one of, of the women, the, the leader of the women's section. So of course, later on, she writes two books that have women's liberation at the center. Uh, and there, though, she's critical of the, I mean, she's very happy about the rise of the women's liberation in the 60s and 70s, but she's critical of, of, especially as they start moving a little to the right by this late 70s and 80s. So that's where she starts saying we need to look at Rosa Luxemburg. Her, her interest in Rosa Luxemburg is very much around trying to get the women's liberation movement in a more revolutionary direction not to, and not to move away from all. Marxism as it was doing, especially by the early 80s with post-structuralism and so on. And then on race, of course, it's much better known. And I'm not gonna, I mean, she wrote it in her whole life, uh, but uh, I just wanna say that somebody mentioned the conversation with Trotsky and CLR James. Uh, well, first of all, I think Raya typed it. I think Raya was the secretary in the room that typed it up, if I remember right. Uh, Secondly, if you read it closely, you'll find that Trotsky is educating CLR James. CLR James is more resistant, is a little bit resistant still to the idea of the autonomy of the black struggle in America. Um, he, so it's part of his education, that conversation with Trotsky, uh, which I think is an interesting point uh, to, to look at. Uh, but I don't want to. I, I don't want to go on too long. I could say a lot more about race and capitalism, and I run some of that. But I'll, I'll end there. Well, um, I uh, we're we're getting near the end, and I, in a way, I want to turn to Bavak because today was such a, a, a an interesting panel titled to me, and when we 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 had Jean Numont speaking on. Uh, a French, a very significant French socialist that most of us here didn't, we had seen his name around here and there, but did not know much about Rosa Luxemburg and, and Raya. Uh, what is it that we as a group of people can take away from this, these three different influential people who are, I mean, Rosa and, 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 and New, the, the Rosa Luxemburg and Raya Donievskaya have like tangible connections, but then again, we've looked at all three and how do we come away from this, Babak? And how did you and Marcello think of this panel, if you don't mind? And then we can uh, visit again with uh, Michael and Kieran on this question, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult question. I, I can't uh, have to really think about it. Uh, but, but uh, you know, in, in the sense that these figures, very important and influential figures, uh, cannot be boxed in certain kind of more hegemonic forms of socialism in the 20th century, made us uh, uh, come up with this, uh, you know, heterodox socialism as a way to bring them together. Um, uh, and there are many overlaps. I mean, the simplest one would be between Luxembourg and Skaya uh, in terms of their cri critique of the Soviet Union. You know, um, in, in that sense, uh, there are sort of common trends that run um, between them. But I, I turn to the ex expert uh, panelists uh, to, to really delve into this. Michael, could you speak to your sense of the three thinkers together and, and what significance it had to you today? 
Uh, firstly, I was also asked what <coughs> would happen if all the Luxembourg would, nev- would not have been killed and so on. Of course, this, these are questions I cannot answer at all. History is such a very complicated process. And often if we are looking back, we see, we think it should have happened this way as it happened. But of course, it's not true. Uh, what I'm thinking is more important is that by uh, we have uh, today discussed three very different figures. And from my point of view, and what I'm interested in, because we are living today, we are living in the beginning of the 21st century, we see we are struck by uh, very deep contradictions of our society. We see the rise of a new type of fascism now, uh, but as a very close to situations uh, 100 years ago. We see a terrible crisis of our civilization. We see a terrible weakness of the left and so on. Yeah? So um, what I would like to, uh, I learned really by, by, good, by Jules Goethe, uh, Goethe and, and also, of course, I have read the books of Dunayevskaya, and I think we should take whatever we can from all these thinkers and persons and um, to learn more how to do better in our own current situation. And also when I was reading the, the books of you, Kevin, um, and so on, I, I think all this is needed. Yeah. And we should, um, and so this is important to educate ourselves and uh, the new generations coming in. Um, and what is also important is my last sentence is we should rethink, but this is a weakness of uh, orthodox Marxism and also of Rosa Luxemburg because I think her idea of socialism, her understanding of socialism did not work. It was in, a, a, in opposition to her own uh, understanding of um, emancipatory movement. So we should find a new understanding of socialism and of um, uh, transformation and revolutionary real politics. And then I hope we will be able to combat the new type of fascism and really to go on for a social ecological transformation we need in the 21st century. Okay, that's all what I can say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Kieran, could you uh, speak to this a bit? Yes, um, I would agree with what Michael has said, um, specifically in relation to the need to reimagine, I think you said, Michael, socialism uh, in the present day. And I think, you know, I, I, I... um, came across Luxembourg far earlier than I came across Dunyanskaya, um, and I found the, the, the finding of Dunyanskaya and the reading of her alongside Luxembourg and other thinkers very illuminating, particularly in relation to that question of, 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 of the socialism of the future, the nature of organisation. She agreed, of course, with much that uh, Luxembourg said in relation to organisation, but also found fault with part of it, and also with her criticism of um, uh, the national question and the notion of self-determination at that moment. So we have now uh, before us, as Michael said, amidst a frightening kind of resurgence of fascism and authoritarianism, a real urgency, I think, um, upon us to work out these organisational questions in a way that can can transcend the debate over the vanguard party and, uh, and perhaps some of the 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 influential but perhaps less successful uh, forms of uh, organization that we we saw in the in the last couple couple of decades where they have um, um the horizontalist kind of committee form structure that we need to retain but that we need to also um uh, think about in in ways that, that can meet the the more practical tasks of of the next 10 and more years Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Kieran. Um, We are near the end. Uh, Are there further questions or statements that anyone would like to make? So, uh, with uh, that resounding lack of response, I will say on... Uh, March 20th, we have our next uh, panel. It's on Marx's theory of emancipation. Uh, It will be at the same time on on, uh, Saturday, March 20th. 
and I saw that no one here took advantage of the great deal that I posted on online, but uh, you can uh, come to that talk. And the other one will be on April 24th, which is a panel that will be addressing the legacy of Frederick Engels um, and, and looking at uh, the legacy of the dialectics of nature and many other aspects of Engels. Babak, is there anything that you would like to say as we, uh, no? No, thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, participating in this fascinating. It was a great uh, meeting Michael and, and Kieran as well. And I, I look forward to the, the, the continuation of the series. And I hope all of you will come back for March 20th and April 24th. And thanks for all coming. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>